This is a study by this German psychologist, um, uh, Eben, Eben Goss, I think that is how you might pronounce his name. But um, in the 1880s, he became interested in how, everybody looks at how people try, how people remember things. Um, but Eben Goss was looking at how do we forget things? And in these days, um, there were not, um, there, there, there were not big, uh, you, you didn't have a, a, a class full of graduate students who you could use as your guinea pig. So he actually did all his early research on himself. And what he would try to do is to sort of come up with these sort of sets of nonsense syllables and, and try to remember them and then look at how, what the decay rate of those was over time. And then his research, and he came up with this a sort of forgetfulness curve. And, and, but his, his research has then been followed up in countless ways. And a, a lot of the, the, all the other studies, they sort of show this same curve. And so what it is, is on the left side of the graph, you have the percent of the information of whatever it is that you've been studying that you retain. And then it is time in a logarithmic scale going out to the right. And so check this out. Within the first 18 minutes of whatever you've been looking at, your brain has forgotten almost half of the material, right? Um, so for all of us educators, this is a really kind of humbling thing. We, we, sometimes people feel like, you know, I must fill this empty vessel with knowledge and information. So I'm gonna tell you a bunch of things. Just know that half of that will be gone within the first 18 minutes. But um, then after the first day, you see um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's below that and over seven days, you know, the, the curve begins to flatten out here over time, but at, um, but, you know, eventually out here, three months later, there's, there's a glimmer of the information that you had originally, but the rest is gone. So one of the first things that this kind of brings to my mind is the functionality of of, of, of keeping notes because how I remember things, it is going to change and change and change and change as, as I kind of get less information um, over time. And if I have, um, so, so, so keeping notes and the importance of that, that's, that's one kind of interesting area of discussion. But the, the second um, piece of this is that then people, the, the follow-up studies on this they're looking at like, well, this is a problem. What can we do about it? And so um, one idea is, um, well, what happens if you review this information periodically? And what they did is they, they, they looked at sort of different intervals of reviewing and the impact that that has on, on memory down the line. So um, let's check out slide number two. All right, now in this one, what they have done is, um, is they have, you've got at different periods, little opportunities for reviewing the information. And the, so the first one was within the first 18 minutes, they go back in and review the information again. And that brings your kind of, oh yeah, back up. And, but then notice that after that, if you did nothing else beyond that, the curve of forgetfulness, it's still, there's a big steep slide, but it's gonna bottom out at a higher level. So that was just reviewing it one time within the first 18 minutes. So you've just learned something, now you're going to review it, all right? But if you also do a second review within that day, look at what happens to that curve. The next was within a week, and then at one month, all right, you see that the, the, the curve is flattening out 
at a higher level. So whatever it is you were trying to do, this ends up being the formula for getting stuff fixed in your head. Um, so you can try all you want in that initial lesson. If you take your notes then and you close your, your, your journal and you don't review it, you are on this bottom curve. Boop, 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 right? So if you are immediately doing something and then by the end of that day doing something with it, there's a dramatic change in that. And then some point in the future, you can even bop it up even more a month later kind of going. But look at the impact just within like what you do with whatever it is you're learning. And so this can be learning from your own direct observation in the field, or this can also be learning from a lecture or a book or something like that. And this, I was thinking, has some pretty profound kind of being able for us as educators to visualize this has me starting to think of what strategies might I use in setting up how I'm doing my own nature journaling and how I'm doing that with my students to enhance their ability to remember all these experiences and, and pieces that they're putting together. So this is what I wanted to show you folks um, at the, the start of our little meeting together. And just see, um, I thought that that might be an interesting little prompt for our, our discussion here. What do, you folks, what do you folks think are the implications of this research on best practices in nature journaling? I'm going to throw in that with nature journaling, one of the things that gives you really great practices is you've got several modalities. You're using your eyes to observe, and then you, your notes are visual, so that's also part of your visual. You're hearing sounds, and maybe you're working with a teacher or an instructor of some sort who's giving you information, and then on top of that, it's a physical thing because hopefully you're in the environment, but also because you're physically recording it so you you're hitting on three different modalities which by in and of itself should help you retain a lot more mm -hmm. so and, and that that also ties into some research on on attention our attention filters out the information that can even get in there in the the first place and by having those different modalities that you're talking about um if all i'm doing is drawing pictures then information that can be best kind of integrated through um, writing or by maybe counting or quantifying something, um, it's not going to it's not going to appear on my journal page or in my brain because I don't have the tool to do that. So what you're saying there um, is that uh, if, let me see if I'm getting this correctly. Because we're using these different modalities, different sorts of information have the opportunity of getting in there in our brains and otherwise they they would not be able to even have a potential place at the table the other the other thing is that when you are seeing something and documenting in your journal that means but as you're doing that you are paying attention to whatever that little thing is right you can't do that i can't mm -hmm. i can't record some notes about something if i'm not paying attention to it so i have to i'm like we're, we're doing it and doing attention the part of your brain that does attention is the same part of your brain that does memory um, there's some some data that shows that information that you don't really attend to within the first 15 seconds of it coming into this the sphere of your senses your brain is going to be your brain will discard right so that which is not attended to is lost immediately right so that doesn't even get in there on that forgetfulness curve right because that never got in there on the first place right so I, I like what you're saying there so by again so you're saying by using more modalities we're giving more sorts of things the opportunity to have a place 
at the table of our attention. Bingo. Bingo. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Um, also, it would seem like it would be beneficial not to just journal something and then close the book on that and never look at it again, but to go back periodically and review your nature journal. Yeah, tell, 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 uh, unpack that a little bit more for me. That's, that's, this, is, this, is, this is interesting. I think we're getting, this might be something that can be really productive. So t say a little bit more about that, Amy, if you would. Well, you know, um, like say if, if you go on a trip and you bring along your travel journal and you write down things you did and you close that book and you put it on a shelf and never look at it again, you may still forget a lot of the details of that trip. But if you revisit it every once in a while and take a look at it and be like, oh yeah, I remember when we went to that museum or I remember seeing that bird in that, you know, different place that's not my home, you know, that was really cool. And so then you kind of, it kind of refreshes your memory. And um, the same would be true with nature journaling. Maybe you journal a maple tree that you saw and a really cool bug that was on it. And you're wondering what's going on there. And if you uh, come back and look at that a little bit later on, you're like, oh yeah, I remember when I saw that bug, that was really neat. And maybe I saw that bug again last week. So you start making some more connections, but also it just brings it more fresh into your memory um, that mm -hmm. you had been looking at that before. That is, this is, this is, this is cool. Um, so I, I, I'm getting, am I getting you correct that you're, you're saying that, that part of your practice should be just not, it's also, you know, it's, it's fun that everyone's wants want to look through your journals, but if that is part of your deliberate practice, understanding that forgetfulness curve and how to have to flatten out at a higher place to build into your practice, kind of reviewing those notes and those journal entries. Yeah, you know, and like you have some fun games for getting the journal entries into the journal. Maybe if we could come up with some fun things like a review um, of those nature journals, that might be kind of, you know, more than just looking at it and saying, oh, yeah, I remember that. But maybe interacting with it in some way might even increase that. I don't know. Just a idea. Mm -hmm. Well, to piggyback on that, it's the, um, the journal share at the end of a session. Yeah. That, that you're going to capture it within 30 minutes that sure. after seeing this mm -hmm. curve it just really hones into me that the extra <laughs> importance of the journal share it's not just about the kids getting um you know feedback on whether they're doing something right um or right in quotation marks um but for them to remember this experience right like let's let's really as educators like really um understand that that journal sharing portion of our lesson is critical to help them remember this experience and if you are able to share that verbally right you did the journal and then you're going to say i saw this really cool bug and it had three stripes on its back and i don't know what it was doing but it was doing this weird thing then that's that second that's that repetition and you're using another sense by speaking it like um katya was saying um and then maybe having a dialogue about it, right? Because then you're kind of like that cognitive part of the brain is going like, okay, I'm trying to make sense of this. So, mm. so yeah, yeah that, that I think is a really great reason for incorporating sharing, journal sharing at the end of your lessons in some, in some way. Maybe in smaller groups, um, you can do, if you're using Zoom, you can break out if you old, have older students. I think this might work or in a Zoom chat where you break out and then among the four, four students, they say like, this is what I drew, this is what I saw, um, and then come back as the big classroom. So at least they're at being able to say what they drew within that first 30 minutes to someone else. And then, yeah, someone was saying, Ivea is saying, and encourage them to maybe share with their friends or family when they get home. Yeah. So that might be the small work. It's like you do your journal and then you um, pick some one thing or two things from that journal entry that um, you learned or was interesting or exciting and you share it with your family. Because then you're like, um, you know, that's the second rep, that could be a second repetition within the day, right? So you're increasing that, that boosting that memory. So this like 
um, you know, I've known about the forgetfulness curve, but I wish I'd known this in um, college because um, all or high school. <laughs> times I crammed for the exam, right? And then the reason why I did well is because it was within that day and I retained everything. But had I been, re you know, re refreshing and, re and revisiting periodically, that could really help students remember. So, yeah. very cool. Yeah, so, yeah, one of the implications of the forgetfulness curve is that, um, you know, you, you might look at something right before a test, but, you know, if, if the day before you had crammed information about that, most of the information from that cram session is already gone by the time you hit the roll into the test. Um, however, you wouldn't need to do that if you had um, reviewed your notes after the class, later that day, and some other point in the semester before that, that, that test, that information would actually, you would not need to cram. If you wanted to like totally blow it out of the water, you could, you know, have that be another review session, but to, to think, and, but, but just sort of to get to remember that, that big drop off on the curve, because the longer you wait, right, the, you know, then you're, you're starting from kind of that lower point again. That's, that's really cool. So, um, you're, you're saying the more th that, like th this opportunity of the journal share, I also, as, as Melinda's been saying, I've been thinking of that. It's like, it's this really neat opportunity for me to get ideas from other people, but I haven't really thought about it in the context of what is the impact of that on that other, that individual's retention of the material. And so what we're doing by building in time to process, process that, to sh anytime you're sharing it with other people, it's one thing to say, look at your notes to share that with other people in a kind of in, in a, in a dynamic way where you're, you're looking at the journal and say like, then this happened, this happened, look, I showed this in this way. All those experiences, that's going to get locked into your brain. And also any strategies, new strategies that you're using, like, like, look over here, I did this enlargement and it really worked. Then what we're also doing is making, putting those tools at that person's fingertips for the next time they sit down with their journal. Um, so it's not just the details of that, um, you know, part of what we're doing is we're increasing our knowledge of natural history. Every time we're journaling, um, you're out there, you're noticing something new, you learn something new about the spider, your understanding of nature just went pink up. But if you, you're also learning strategies, ways of taking information and, and representing that on our page using words, pictures, numbers. So then you're giving yourself more, uh, you're, improve, you're increasing the chances that these new techniques are going to be repeatable in future explorations. And um, then as, as, as Katya was saying, you know, you've got these different modes, you've got strategies within each of those modes that you have, you have more of a toolkit to help you attend to different sorts of details and whatever phenomenon is in front of you. Yeah. Um, I was thinking of a question after the um, I, I notice, which could be asking them to say, how could I use this information in the future? You know, how, how might, what might I do with this information? So then they've revisited. I'm not sure how I would phrase that, but so you're, you're saying to have them ask, how can I reuse this information? Yeah. How can I repurpose this in a yeah. different way? That's, that yeah. is... How is it useful to... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's, there's some research that shows that if you are learning something um, that, and you, you know that, for instance, you're going to be teaching this later, it gives you an immediate, easy way to think about how I could use this information. It makes that information more right. relevant. And you're, so, so uh, uh, what, um, how could I reuse this, uh, repurpose? Great. I know when I'm doing my notes, listening to some of your classes, I'm thinking of how I'm going to use that information to teach seniors. And so I take notes with that in mind, you know, and 
then then I go back and revisit it because I'm changing it a little bit. Yeah. Jack, um, I'm Brian. I'm in, in Sacramento. I run the Great Valley Nature Journal Club for folks who I haven't met. Um, we meet on Saturdays. <laughs> One thing that I've noticed is we've had so many um, classes going on that there's this constant input. And so I sort of switched our meetings to doing um, one topic a month. And at the start of it, I have all the participants, whatever ages they are, write down what their intention is for the month. It doesn't have to overlap with what we're doing, um, but I like them to share what they are interested in doing at the start of the month. And then sharing, you know, as they go along, if they're doing journal pages that fit with their um, intentions, I like to see that and how they're kind of furthering their study. So some people are learning about butterflies, like Heather's doing a deep dive on monarchs and People have different things that they're interested in. And so seeing how they can continue that process and then reviewing it at the end of the month. You know, did you write about what you were interested in? Did you draw about it? Did you do some of that? And I think for educators who are doing a module for a course, you know, you could do something similar where at the beginning, you know, you explain what you're gonna explain to the students, right? It's sort of the familiar PowerPoint presentation where you say, I'm gonna talk about this and then periodically you can review and say, hey, we've learned all of this already and isn't that neat? And then, you know, rather than doing it just as a quiz at the end, like, hey, did you actually retain this? You can kind of do it as you go along, right? And then have the recaps as you're uh, proceeding. So I found that students, you know, even if they're, even if they feel guilty, like they haven't been doing what they said they were going to, they can see, you know, why that was. Um, because, you know, you could take a class on drawing horses and then the next week it's butterflies and then it's something else. And that can lead to kind of this overwhelm in your brain. And so, you know, trying to do it, you know, in a more methodical way was helpful for me. Um, and I think the people get something out of it as well. So you're, you're thinking about sort of on a, on a meta level, um, giving people a scaffolding a structure to hang ideas on and then when you um, instead of jumping around to a bunch of different things you're going to embellish that part of the tree more that you give them first a framework and then you can decorate it and then you can build out another framework over here and decorate that out am i understanding that correctly yeah and then when they think about all the different tools that they have you know they can apply those when they're trying to learn you know something and all of that kind of builds off of that but you know making it you know, we talk about mindfulness a lot and just, you know, if you're learning something on your own, how can you kind of go about that in a structured way? Um, you know, with, you know, setting an intention and saying, you know, this is, it makes yourself accountable too. And it takes away the, you know, dread of waking up and saying like, I need to do something in my nature journal, but I don't know what to do today. Like there's just nothing to draw or there's too much to draw. This just says, hey, it's 6 a.m. I'm going to go sit in my sit spot and I'm going to draw this salvia and I'm going to make some observations about that. And then when we talk about other things, maybe we talk about the sky and then as you have new tools and techniques, you can go back to your same sit spot and say, okay, well, now I know something about the sky. It's cloudy. Does that affect, you know, the interactions in this ecosystem? Do we see birds being more attracted to the salvia when it's raining or when it's sunny or when it's hot or when it's cold or different times of the day? And, you know, it just takes away some of the, you know, if you're trying to do this on your own, building the habit at the beginning is the really hard part, I think. And so setting an intention for what you want to do and just taking away the guesswork at each moment helps establish a practice. I see so many people who, you know, see beautiful pictures and then think like, I can't do that, but this is the, you know, it's just the pencil miles thing. And you, in order to do the pencil miles thing, you have to be there, right? Um, so and the, the, the points that Brian is talking about here tie a lot into the idea of cognitive load. That's how much our brains can really handle at 
one point. The more that things are kind of popcorning around, not structured under a theme, um, we get the, the thing that you were studying, like let's say it's, it's gates, and now it's how to draw a snowstorm and you know, whatever it is. The, the, when, there's no, when there's no structure to it, no meta structure, the gates actually becomes a distraction to the, 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 uh, the snowstorm thing that you're now working with. So by building more underneath that, you know, like if we're going to be spending a time like drawing weather and that's kind of a thing we're digging into, then things start to have relationships. This concept or idea ties into this other thing that you're looking at. And um, that um, helps you be able to go deeper into an area. So when people talk about cognitive load, there's a couple of different types of cognitive load. There is the, what's called the, called the germane cognitive load, and that is the mental cost of kind of doing a deep dive and stitching together and associating ideas and, and the energy that that takes in your brain. Um, extraneous cognitive load is the distraction that come on. So if there's this other piece that like we're starting to kind of really get into some aspect of, of, of what you're doing. And then you're, you know, I, this sort of like, for instance, makes me think about some of my um, weekly workshops. By chance, I ended up with several on kind of um, a large mammal anatomy and gates all in a row. But I had intended to do those all in one class, but, but because I couldn't, I then had several doing that. And I, my sense is that that was helpful to people. By accident, I started having some of this, this kind of a theme. Still, I've got a lot of things popcorning around, um, but maybe I want to move more in that direction that you're doing, Brian, is that you know, for a month or so, have um, you know, different topics, but they would all relate to some larger, some larger theme. might be a way of kind of reducing some of the extraneous cognitive load so that thinking about the gallop doesn't, isn't distracted by the structure of the penguin. Yeah, for me, I just kind of happened on that because I was teaching topics every week and I just couldn't keep up with the pace. Like, you know, you have the background in this. And so, you know, you see this in the Ask Jack where you can just respond to anything off the top of your head. For me, it was like, yeah, this is too much and I need to kind of back away from it. Um, and so that was my sort of, I kind of stumbled on doing it that way. But um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't a recommendation for you. I mean, what you're doing no, no, is no, fantastic, no. but it, well, I just found it, 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 it would improve my game. Um, so I, I make no claims to be doing anything right, right? I'm just like, I'm a work in progress and I'm doing like the best I can with what I got. Um, but the idea that you just suggested there, just, just you watch my site. I think you might see some of your ideas coming <laughs> back at you. But John, you uh, yeah. do, you do structure Brian your classes pretty well. I did your bird uh, drawing classes with Audubon a couple of months ago. And the way you structured it, songbirds, uh, raptors, and then, or I'm sorry, raptors were last, water birds, and then raptors. And so you were, dealing with different types of birds. And yeah, it was a it was a shorter pocket. Like when you're doing it in your classroom, you've got a whole week to work on it or a month to work, however long you decide. But you had structured it pretty pretty intelligently. And my birds look great now, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Um, but, but you see, there, there, there's a, an exception that I think proves the rule. You're saying that, Jack, when you did this series on drawing birds, that was effective for me. Um, but um, the reason that there was a series is because I partnered with Audubon and they said like, can you do a lot of stuff on birds? Because Audubon, we like the birds, right? And so I did like, okay, this bird thing, this bird thing, this bird thing. By the way, another Audubon series, we're setting it up right now, should be announced soon. Different topics, it will build on that previous one, All right? Um, but, but if you look over in at, at the regular workshops that I've been doing, I've been doing like one on like just sort of random topics. Like, like if 
for a while I did stuff on reptiles, right? And like we did stuff on turtles and crocodilians and then, you know, or whatever it is, you know, there'd be pieces of those puzzle pieces that could connect together. And I think that that might make things easier for people to kind of uh, grapple with. Um, the, um, so here, here's, here's an, an, another thought about reviewing, reviewing notes. Um, has anybody ever done post hoc composition? All right. So, um, M Melinda, could, could you explain to people what, what, what that is? Yeah, um, it is when, um, well, the, the way that I understand it is going back in my journal pages and going to um, a previous page and adding some elements on the page that will help tie things together and will help um, cl bring clarity to the information. So for Jack has some really great examples in his How to Draw Nature or the Nature Journaling book where he has the red shouldered hawk where he shows a bunch of different sketches that you do live in the field. And then when you come home, it looks like a whole bunch of sketches here and there and it might be confusing and hard to understand um, what's going on in it. And I, I believe the purpose is not to make a pretty picture and not to make a pretty page, but really to help um, make it a cohesive um, learning experience. So you're revisiting or I'm revisiting thinking about what I saw and then grouping things together with maybe little boxes or putting lettering or putting like little background behind it to tie different components together. And um, that's a lot of fun, um, especially because I like to draw on the field and, and my pages get kind of messy. Um, and later on where I'll put those in, um, um, I don't know what they're called, like embellishments or a little, um, uh, so I lost the word um, to to tie things together. Yeah. So yeah. So so there. Um, the, the yeah the idea of the, the the post hoc composition it comes from sort of a a, a bad pun um, that you know the hawk has flown away and after it's gone you are going to you know yeah. create the rest of the composition on the on this page. Um, it's page one twenty three if you have the book. Um, but. The, um, the, the idea is that you're looking at stuff that you've already put and then you're using frames and subtitles or big titles to say, what are the big ideas that I'm doing here? How can I group things? Um, and um, you know, spending a little bit more time on a page that you've already done to kind of pull things together. So as you glance at the page, that it makes a little bit more sense. So a, um, I'm thinking about that post hoc as um, uh, sort of reworking a journal page that you've already done in terms of reviewing your notes. That when you're doing that, that is actually a real deep review of the things that you had been doing in the field. And you're noticing, like sometimes you're putting a star or, um, you know, uh, you know how Akshay puts those little kind of googly eyes, you know, looking over at um, whatever little critter is like a really interesting observation. You'll see Fiona putting big question marks next to things that are like really kind of uh, lighting her up. Um, she'll put uh, wow boxes where like there's a big discovery. She'll put a little box next to it that says wow and they're like stars around it that, that just says like, you know what? This was something that I'm, I'm gonna pay that was a surprise to me. I'm gonna pay a little bit more attention to it. All of that is kind of meta level thinking about the stuff that you've already put on the page. So actually building into your journaling process, I'm gonna get collect stuff in the field and then realize that that post hoc composition, putting boxes around related things, drawing arrows between things that are connected, coming up with a question that is the question behind the question that you hadn't asked yet, all of that stuff is a way of reviewing and kind of getting more out of the experience that you had. It reminds me of a little bit of, res of the research on the impact of the photography memory impairment um, research. Um, and in that research, 
they had people um, they, they had people go through an art museum and take photographs of pieces of art that really moved them and spoke to them. And then they talked to the people who were taking those photographs later on and they said, so tell us about those. And they're like, I'll have to get back to you on that because they had forgotten. Their memories of what the things that they had gone click with were terrible. And they were much worse than people who were asked just to go through the museum and to observe things and notice the things that really spoke to them. You asked those people about it later. They'd say like, well, I was looking at this one piece, but and it was like this, and but this dark in the corner made me sort of think of the kind of existential angst in my soul. And you know, what, whatever it was, they had much better memories of it. But um, so that was the first part of that um, memory impairment, the photography effect. That you know, you take your click, your snapshot, and your brain stops paying attention. The follow-up research was really, really interesting. What they had people do is then take their photographs, sort them, organize them, pick out the ones that were really meaningful to them. So they were post experience doing stuff with their photographs, kind of real organizing it and kind of putting titles with things and kind of thinking about them a little bit more. And then you ask those people about their experience and they had a high memory of it. So what it, was is there was this secondary experience where you were re-engaging with the data and as a result of that your brain had more time to notice what it's noticing to actually notice stuff then and to make meaning of the things that you are doing so i've never thought really thought about the post hoc composition as being really important for that purpose that sort of post experience review you know for instance like this can be the review the 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 the, the hawk has flown away and now within the first 18 minutes i'm going to do my post hoc composition right i am now i've just bumped myself up on that learning curve and if at the end of the day then i go and review this do a journal share and as part of that i kind of you know explain part of my experience and not just be looking at other people's pieces but if we build into that journal share a place for me to kind of talk about my experience and that sort of thing that is those first three in the first day so there's the getting the experience there's the review within the first um 18 minutes and then there was a second review that day that might be a really interesting way of just structuring into this journal learning process these approaches you have an advantage, which is that because you're experienced, you go in knowing what you're looking for with the nature journaling. Um, I'm a newbie to this. So when I go in, I'm like, okay, look at that color. Oh, and I'm looking at too many things, which distracts me. So I'm finding that your nature journaling classes are really helpful in that way. But you go in and you're like looking for the curve of, you know, the, the, the shape of the B, the, the negative space around. Um, you're looking for the flight pattern but you have specific things that you look for. And so that's part of the trick for teaching is letting the, is, is directing the kids, watch the way the leaves come out of the branches, watch the way the flower grows. Do you see all the petals coming out from the center or something else happening? Do you need to kind of direct their attention? I think I've got, I've got little kids, so. Yeah. Um so I, I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And that, that when I am looking at things to make a drawing of them, um, very often as I'm studying how, like how do I draw turtles? I'm learning about their structure and all these sort of things. And then I'm trying to sort of synthesize that into like, how would I go about representing that? What are the places in that that would be challenges? And so very often I kind of know um, that there, there will be, you know, I, I really should look at that negative space while the bird is up there in front of me on the wire. And that makes a huge difference in how my, my drawing looks. But um, also wanted to say that like another really intentional part of my process, because if I just focus on that alone, then I get into the danger of drawing the bird in my mind, right? Drawing the, the way I think it's supposed to look rather than, and so, so part of my really deliberate process is I try to be kind of hyper aware of the, it, it comes in as a very subtle feeling to me, but when I notice something that is different than the way that I expect it to be, 
it often kind of comes in as this little like, huh, right? Just a little, it's not like, <gasps> right? I kind of get this little, huh, right? And, and so what I'm, what I'm doing is as I'm out there in the field, I'm kind of, anytime I try to, I've gotten myself to the point where, where when my brain goes, huh, right? That means stop and lean in here because there's something in reality that is different than the way that I expect it to be. And I want to try to collect as many of those little, little moments. Um, so there's a wonderful quote by Isaac Asimov that the most exciting um, phrase in, in, in science, the one that comes before all the, the, the great discoveries is not Eureka, but that's funny. Right? So kind of harvesting those, so still trying to be really attentive to those that's funny moments. Um, so very, you're, you're absolutely right that there's a bunch of things that I have like it's a bird and I'm coming up with strategies to help me do that. And then it turns its head three quarter view. And I know I've got kind of a game plan of how I'm going to start to get that down on paper. That helps a ton. Um, and so the more that we kind of, the more that we can get visual representation strategies, visual vocabulary into kids' brains, into kids' pencils, that's going to really help them visually record what they see. And the other piece is then, um, not just sort of going with any formula, but also being really aware of where nature is surprising you. And those, it's in those, hidden in those surprises is that, um, that, that, that some of those, um, that, that's very often where, where the learning is coming in because nature is showing you that there's something in your mental model that is different than reality, and uh, that's that's where learning hides. Um, um, so I was wondering um, if Anne, would you be willing to share with us um, a little bit, a uh, hold up to the screen, some of the post hoc work that you are working on right now? Um, Absolutely. And I'm I'm sorry, I'm not an educator. I'm just fascinated by all this, so I appreciate sort of sitting in on this and. While you were talking, I took some pages that I have been working on for about two weeks. I started this with Melinda on a Sunday morning uh, back in early August. And this is uh, sunflowers in my garden. And today, while we were talking, I just added this title and I added the arrows. So you can see it's a sequence. And um, I'm thinking about answering some questions that I had. I had, you know, I used some of Akshay's eyes. I love those. Um, and was wondering like, why aren't these following the sun? And I looked it up and found out that as they get older, they don't need to follow the sun anymore. So they tend to stay eastward facing. Um, so I'll probably add that somewhere, maybe by this great big one. And this one's leaning over by now and it's like maybe too heavy to follow the sun too. Um, but it's just been such a great learning process and I keep coming back to it. And not only do I feel like the page is getting better, but this is getting better. The electric meat in my head. Thank you very much. <laughs> this, this, is, this, is, this is sort of a great example of this. So as you were, so Anne is putting in, so putting in titles, she's thinking about what is the big picture here. She's looking back over her questions, coming up with answers to these questions, drawing arrows between things, kind of guiding, sort of telling the story again. This is that, I mean, what a powerful form of post-production processing is uh, going on here. That is, it's, I, th I think that that's, if we can get our students doing what you're doing right there, yeah. that's going to take all these, these journal pages to, that's going to take them to the next level. So, and one thought I had on that, and I, again, I'm not an educator, um, but I know that if I have to teach somebody something that I'm learning, I learn it so much better myself. Um, so I'm wondering if you do breakout sessions and you have the kids teach each other how they came about this, like, like when we're watching Ray Bonto share his work and he's so wonderful and sometimes he shows how he got there and he shows his steps 
and he could explain that to another kid and they could maybe one of them's working on gates and one of them's working on uh, skeletal you know what's going on in a penguin's neck or something but if they can share what's under the hood and what's under their hood um, maybe it sinks in better so that's just my my uneducated idea thanks um. Can, can I add, Anne, um, you know, you were following your curiosity with the sunflower and had those questions. And, you know, we do the I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. And I wonder if I'm uh, spending time with the could it be part of the question, like, okay, the sunflowers, I thought they moved with the sun, but this guy's not moving, it's hanging down. And so the, that's the observation. And maybe even before you look it up, just sitting with that mystery, like encouraging students to sit with the mystery, don't go to Google right away and say, what do you know in your observation, in, in what you've seen about nature, what could be some possible answers? And that ties into the scientific you know, discovery, the method, right? Of like, if, if we are, if we are classroom teachers, we're using this in NGSS is taking that next step. I think Chris had, had mentioned something about this too. It's like, what could be the answers, you know? And that could be a whole discussion, classroom discussion. Like, well, if we talked about um, ecosystems, like Brian's talking about, maybe we just already talked about ecosystems. So maybe in that context, what could be some possible answers? So, I mean, I can see this, <laughs> <laughs> really like so many different ways that you can go with like helping oh my gosh helping children learn in such um such a meaningful way instead of memorizing facts um this is just hitting me right now it's just like this is so important so all of you here whether you are at you know technically educators or not you are you have the ability to teach you know you share this with your girlfriend you share this with your partner and say hey look look what i thought about sunflowers you know and i didn't know. Uh, and i've watched sunflowers you know a lot and i didn't know that they are just they don't need the, to follow the sun anymore so you know you are teaching other people through sharing your nature journal so i just want to you know right there put a plug in for every one of you you don't need a teaching credential to teach people. Well, thank you. And um, I must say that I posted this earlier on, you know, maybe four or five days ago to the Facebook Nature Journaling group with the question. Uh, you know, I didn't answer the question. I hadn't looked up the answer yet, but I kind of said, gee, I thought they followed the sun. What's up, what's up with that? And I got some great answers. One of them was maybe the seeds were from the Southern Hemisphere and they're confused. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, but you know, just some great, great information and then some more I wonders and some more observations and it kind of turned into this great conversation. So I was happy to just start that curiosity and watch it go. It was fun. Yeah, I, I think wrestling with that question, that's the other thing that I want to put in here because I think this helps memory, is being comfortable with not looking up. I think our culture is so... Um, quick to go to the phone and say, hey, let me Google it. Let me Google that. You know, what kind of bird is it? I don't know. I can tell you what it is. But, you know, you're taking away that opportunity from the student to explore, to dive into it, and to own that question and the answer and that opportunity to just, you know, get all this electric meat working, right? So as educators, I encourage you to not answer right away. Maybe you're already doing this, but maybe as parents, not answer those questions right away. Just give them that space for them to just ponder, yeah, what, what could it be? What do you think? You know, and have that opportunity to just stretch those muscles, I guess. I don't know what they're called, that stretch the brain, you know, the activity. Um, and I think that when you do that, you're also retain, you're going to retain it better because you're, you're, you know, anytime you're spending more time with it. And then that, that, um, the neurons that are firing, right. And the connections that are being made in that moment. I mean, that's, that's so incredible. So, um, you know, I try not to go to Google and look things up. I really try to sit with like, what do I know in my life, in my, my heart? What could it possibly be? And to be 
unafraid of asking questions. I think in our culture, we're so judgmental. It's like, well, if you ask a question, then you're dumb. So I'm not going to raise my hand and ask a question. But what the nature journaling, nature journal is doing for us is, is giving us permission to be okay, to not have the answer. In fact, we don't want the answer. As scientists, if we knew it all, we would not have any more discoveries, right? So I have to be willing to not know the answer and willing to just ask questions. And I got that feeling coming up with the lightning storm because I don't know how lightning works. And I thought, you know, I'm a smart adult. I have a master's degree. I should probably know the answer. But you know what? I, I felt that come up in me when I was writing it in my journal because I know I'm going to show you my journal page and I don't want everyone to know that I don't know how lightning may, lightning works. But I wrote it because that's anything that, like Jack is always saying, when that question comes up, you got to write it down right away because that is something that is for your for your learning, for, for nature is revealing something to you, right? And then when it reveals it to you, you could be the messenger to share it with other people and like your sunflower question. So it's, it's, it's bigger than just looking at nature and observing. It's so much more than that. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> Uh, this I, I, this is a, such a beautiful, beautiful, um, and powerful conversation that we, we started talking off uh, talking about nature journaling. We still are, but as you're suggesting there, Melinda, the connections between what we've got going on here and 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 and, and, and living this life is it's 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 the same. Um, I, I was wondering if I could uh, get Amy to just to talk to this group a little bit about uh, visual thinking strategies. Um, she's pointing out that there's a lot of, this is a, a system originally designed for looking at pieces of artwork. And it's, it's brilliant. It's really, really good stuff. Um, but uh, Amy, would you be willing to kind of uh, talk to us a little bit about VTS? Sure. Um... So uh, as a teacher in Mill Valley, we were all trained in visual thinking strategies about 15 years ago, I think. And it's a way of looking, it started actually as a way of looking at art. And um, it was, it's great for students because um, there, there's, no, there's no answer. You're just looking at um, a piece of art and asking three questions. What do you, um, what's going on in this picture, uh, what more can we find, and uh, what makes you think that. And as those discussions um, open up uh, and the kids speak to each other, they're, they're listening, but you're also paraphrasing for them. So you might say, um, so what you're saying is, and you're not paraphrasing with teacher language, you're paraphrasing with their language, um, which is really important for second, second language learners. You're just scaffolding a little bit with, you might say their words and then add on another word. Um, but what, what um, the people who started the program found is that not only does it work really well for looking at art, it, looks, it works really well for looking at um, science. And so they've been training doctors at um, it, using this, and they're finding that doctors are making fewer mistakes uh, because they're not just waiting to see what they expect, but they're actually looking closely. And um, so I put the link in there for visual thinking strategies. You can use it with poetry. You can use it. You can use it for anything that you just want to know more about. By just, it's a way of asking questions and looking. Uh, looking at things differently um so okay. and what were the three questions um so what do you see in this picture so if you're doing it for science i with kids i usually just say um what do you it's kind of like what do you notice uh or what's going on here um and then the next one is um what um let's see what do you see that makes you say that? So if they say I'm looking at a, at a leaf, what do you see that makes you say that? So you're kind of digging deeper. And then the next, uh, the next question is what more can we find? Or what more can you find? 
Interesting. And there's, there's just been so much thought on kind of refining those questions. And, and they've done lots of testing with the impact of kind of variations of this with, with, with students. This is a beautiful, beautiful system for kind of uh, opening up uh, lateral thinking. Yeah, it's very, it's very simple and very elegant because any, anyone can do it. We've been using it in the school, kindergarten through middle school, and, and, then, and then you can start adapting it for anything. But it's really using the children's language to describe things that they're seeing without giving them the inf without giving up the information. Um, you're not talking about a certain art period or a certain. It's exactly what we were talking about. You're not googling it. You're just making sense of what you see. Nice. Oh, thank you, thank you very much for 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 sharing that with us. Um, this this is this is, is is really fun. I I, I want to 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 thank uh, everybody here for uh, your your participation in these workshops and these discussions. Um, this is a new field, and together we are we're we're pushing it forward. We're trying to figure out the best practices for doing this while we're in the middle of it. And as we do that, the more that we can share those with others and think really intentionally about it, the more we're gonna bring this, this field forward. So I look forward to, to, to more of these workshops with you. In just a moment, we're gonna um, let you return to the, the day. Um, but just kind of remembering that forgetfulness curve, uh, we're going to use, just take one more minute, and I'm going to ask everybody to um, reflect on the discussion from the day and what we're going to do is think for a moment about um, think for a moment about what are some little nuances that kind of came up in today's discussion that your own personal brain is likely to forget unless you put a post-it of some point by that point. And the way we're going to do that is by either kind of writing some of those ideas into the, the, the chat um, or to um, just a few, we'll have time for a couple of people just to quickly kind of share those on the screen. So this is gonna be kind of just popcorn. Um, uh, we'll just uh, ask you to, to, to pop on, just like, here's a reminder, here's a thought that I'm taking away. And then boom, 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 boom. Are you ready? So um, when you're, you've got your, your thought, you're ready, kind of unmute yourself and drop it in. Um, this is Mary, probably the least experienced person, and this is actually changing the way I'm going to be working um, because while I, I know so little as an amateur and a newcomer, uh, I capture things in the forest. I don't know what they are, and uh, then I never get around to revisiting that because I go on to something else. Uh, but meanwhile, I still don't know what they are. So this is going to change where I may create categories like insects or uh, insects in my, in my yard or in the forest and just put multiple things on a page to come back to as I then go away and do research and add notes and do that post-processing because I have to go away to find out things. Most of the time I don't have any idea what this beautiful bug is <laughs> and, and, and I can continue to come back. Uh, as I learn things. And then uh, the thing you're adding that I hadn't thought about as much was the, the titles, the directions, the arrows, the things that make it not only an attractive and understandable page, but you know, causes me to review as I organize. So thank you. This is life-changing as by discovering you four years ago. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. The biggest thing I'm taking away is the um, post hoc, um, bringing that into my classes and um, really reinforcing um, when I come back from class, reviewing what we did the pr previous week. So that'll be one week away and a little help reinforce um, information. With seniors just taking away the stigma that reviewing is bad. I mean, go over things many, many times and be proud of it. 
I like the idea of not immediately giving answers to things, but letting yeah. the students and myself, you know, try and figure out like based on, you know, what, what might be causing this. Mm -hmm. And then I can go look it up. <laughs> <laughs> but first I have to think about it. Thank you again for participating in this. It's really fun learning together with all of you. And I look forward to seeing you folks again soon.